we play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> live from Little Rock, it's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Sachs. Thanks so much for joining me, whether you're listening live over the air or if you're listening via podcast or on Krypton Radio. I'm so glad to have you. Got a great show today, so let's get right to it. We are in a temporary station or a temporary studio this afternoon because of sports ball, and uh, we're, we're working frantically to get our guest on by Skype. Uh, who is actually Frank Mincer. That's right, the Frank Mincer. Steve, my man, my engineer in there, is is working frantically to try to uh, get Skype hooked up with Frank. We've, uh, yeah, I'm just lurking back There here, you go, man. Frank Mincer. Okay, Everything's, everything works out in the end. Man, so glad to have you, Frank. Uh, basically, hey, thanks for the invite, Shane. Yeah, Sounds pretty cool. Yeah, man, I'm really, I'm really glad to have you on. We've, I'm going to do some housekeeping notes just real super quick. And then we'll get directly to talking with you, uh, the Frank Mincer of Redbox D and D fame and new fame with the, your Imperia setting that you're doing. So I'm going to do some housekeeping notes really quick, and then we will uh, we will charge right on with the show, folks. Again, this is Shane plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host Shane Stacks. You just heard Frank Mincer. That's right, the Frank Mincer, who we'll be talking with today. Steve, say hi to everybody. Working hard there in the uh, engineering booth. Hi, Steve. Hey, Steve. So uh, normally we have Zach, but Zach is working working sports ball. Uh, was it Washita Baptist? Yeah, they're playing uh, uh, somebody. Somebody. They're playing the other team for six weeks, and we do this every year. Uh, you know, it's important to the station. And important to local people to have have the football, the Washita Baptist football helps keep everybody on the air. So w- once a year for about six weeks, we come over to Sister Station, ninety nine five. So for the next six weeks, instead of being on ninety six five at one o'clock on Saturdays, I'm on ninety nine five. So if you're a normal Faith Talk listener and you're like, "Wow, what's this?" One, I hope you enjoy it. But two, it'll just be for six weeks. Uh, and then, you know, I'll be back over on 96.5 once sports ball ends. Uh, the other thing is this show will be repeated on 96.5 Faith, or not Faith Talk, 96.5 The Answer on Sundays at 5 p.m. So, it, you know, I get I get double play. Frank Mincer gets double play on two different stations. And if we have a new number temporarily, uh, I have a super huge uh, note in here from Steve because he wants to make sure that everything goes off as smooth as possible. So he want to make sure I knew. He wrote it in big, huge letters, uh, 501-404-6560. So if anyone wants to talk to Frank Mincer, you could uh, call 501-404-6560. Or you can tweet me at Shane Plays. That's S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S. And I will monitor that. And if anyone has a question or comment for Frank, I will make sure to get that into the mix. The other thing is, don't forget, speaking of Shane Plays, show notes and links for the uh, podcast version will be up at shaneplays.com. Last week's show is 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 on the website right now in, in the podcast universe and replaying this week on Crypton Radio. And that was the Apple II in gaming history with David L. Craddock, which is a really good show. Frank, did you ever have an Apple II by any chance? Oh, sure. Uh, before that, I had a, a Mac Plus with oh. a whole 512K memory. It was dynamite great machine yeah it was yeah we talked last week about the importance of the apple II not only to getting personal computers into people's homes but also its massive influence on gaming uh and then of course D D and role-playing games informed a lot of the early computer games so it was a really good show uh folks this show does go out as a podcast on my blog at shameplays.com itunes google play music stitcher iheart radio soundcloud and more and uh, last but never ever least, Shane Plays is carried a week delayed on Krypton Radio. Krypton Radio is sci fi for your Wi Fi. Uh, KryptonRadio.com. Go over there and listen to that excellent station that Gene Turnbow has uh, put together with some other fine folks. And having said that, we'll go right to it. If people know, this is Frank Mincer. And among other things, this isn't the only thing he did, but he's best known. For millions of D&D fans, as the author of the quote-unquote red box version of D&D that came out in the 80s. Uh, There's Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, but then there was also Basic, Expert, um, 
what did it go? Advanced, Immortal. I, I can't remember the five. Uh, you know, but you had a succeeding series of boxes as your characters went up in uh, level. Uh, and and so many people that play D and D today, or DMD to D and D, or that D and D is uh, close to their hearts, got their start on the red box version of D and D. But that's not all Frank did. You were you were a game designer in general, and you worked with TSR. Uh, would you like to you know kind of give any other uh, credentials out there or, or stuff that you've done, Frank? Well, since this is, uh, I'm going to jump slightly off topic right out of the gate and give you trouble. Okay, um, that's fine. My my name is Frank, and I'm a gamer. Okay. Now let let's uh, you, you throw in the word the Frank Menser an awful yeah. lot. So let's get off of that high horse. Okay, we'll and climb down off that horse. Go back to roots like we all got started with. Now we probably sat around the kitchen table or dining room with the folks playing games like Monopoly or Scrabble or things like that as we grew up. We may have gotten into card games and stuff like that. What I'm getting at is all of these are competitions. Going back to the dawn of human history with the ancient Greek Olympics, we had physical competitions. And then as time progressed, we had chess, checkers, and then other mental competitions. But it was all about competition. We're competitive, competitive beings, you know, human beings like this. And we end up ruling our planet pretty much and controlling our entire envir environment because we're so competitive. But we're also intelligent. We pursue chess and other abstract pursuits, the arts, opera, if you like it, that deep end. But certainly films, you know, and TV shows, all entertainments in general. And in the early 70s, something remarkable happened in the entire field, the vast field of human entertainment. Two guys, uh, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, thought up this game Dungeons and Dragons. But in the process of doing that, and we, we've all heard the stories about uh, what it is and fantasy and slaying dragons and all that stuff, but what it really is at the basis of it is a way to have fun instead of competing all the time by cooperating. Now, this is a quantum shift and a quantum leap in types of games. And even in this game, you have plenty of competition. You go out and compete with monsters. Uh, you compete with other who's the biggest and best or who's the smartest or who can cast the best spells. But the, com the cooperative aspects come to the forefront. And part of that, then, is playing the role of a character. Maybe you just give them an accent. Maybe you've developed a full background and can recite a family history and some great revenge or lineage thing or some objective that you're working for in life, just like we do in real the real world. But being able to incorporate all this into an open-ended thing that we call a game, but very often everybody wins, so it doesn't really qualify as a game. But it's hard to explain how important this was to folks who don't play these games and who are quite happy with, you know, Star Wars Monopoly or something like that. Uh, so that's basically where I'm coming from in all the projects I'm doing, in everything I say and post is to try and increase the awareness. It was great to hear you talk about local team sports. You mentioned a Baptist group, you know, in, yeah. in the field they're competing. This increases a sense of community. It lets us all tune in and root for the, the local favorites, and we start paying attention to community things and the folks next door. It's way cool. In the same way... We're working, my company and others, are developing more community feel amongst folks who play these delightful tabletop games and especially paying attention to the folks who are trying to take the extra step and make it more about people and less about just chopping up monsters and running around doing the usual things we've been doing since the dawn of human history. So that's where I'm coming from, and that's really what the Imperia Project, our new Kickstarter, is all about. Well, that is a fantastic uh, intro. I've, I've never had a guest uh, intro themselves quite that comprehensively, and I really appreciate it. So I will not refer to Frank Mincer as the Frank Mincer for the rest of the, uh, the show. He is a gamer among gamers like all other gamers, and he's also trying to increase the, the understanding and visibility of, of what gaming can be. So, um, again, you know, thanks for coming on the show. I'm, I'm excited to help you. Uh, talk about, I want my listeners to know about Imperia. 
which is is unique in a couple of ways. And and by the way, thank you for also making sure to mention Dave Arneson because I have deep respect for Gary Gygax. But Dave Arneson was also an equal co-creator of of Dungeons and Dragons. And Dungeons and Dragons, if people understand the history, would not be what it is without Dave Arneson. Uh, and therefore, role playing games, hobbies, and stuff as we know them today would not be what they are without Dave Arneson. And I'm not trying to diminish Gary Gygax. He was, you know, sure. he was very strong on the when, business. When you end. have a partnership yeah. like that, there's always a fine line to walk. I was a right. personal friend of both of them, more so to Gary, and hung out with his whole family and still good friend of the family. Uh, but the, one of our main disagreements is I believe that Gary was the most most grand, glorious, amazing war gamer I had ever met with a vision and the ability to create TSR and drive it and spread D&D throughout the world. But I don't think D&D, the role-playing game, would have come to exist without that spark of genius from Dave Arneson looking at the characters, the players, mm -hmm. more than just the intricacies of the war game and the intellectual challenge. Well, from what I understand, Dave Arneson... Uh, you know, the one thing that we're blessed with right now is there's been a, a, an abundance of biographies and interest in the history of D&D &D and role-playing games. And they always end up talking to me along the way. It's yeah, which, which, strangely enough, yeah. Uh, you know, although you're quite humble about it, you're, you know, very, you're very important to a lot of people in the hobby. Um, but, you know, Dave Arneson was the one that actually kind of came up with the role-playing aspect of it. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it is well documented. Yeah, and he the took... combat system they used was called at the time Chainmail. It was another product from TSR, the war game company at the time. Right. Uh, Chainmail didn't lead to D and D. It was just the combat system used. One minor misperception. Okay. Yeah, I've always understood it was just kind of a progression, but uh, but anyway, Dave Arneson's very very important to the history. He he actually ran Gary Gygax and some others through, I think it was a Blackmore dungeon crawl, if I'm not mistaken. And that then, sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, and then it just blew Gary's mind, and Gary's like, this is lightning in a bottle, we need to do something with this. Uh, and then, you know, of course, Gary was very strong, both on the gaming front, but also the business front. Uh, but anyway, so what's unique about Imperia is, one, as I understand it, it was it's a setting that was officially approved by Gary Gygax for you to develop. Um, and then, and it's, and it's, it's, it's on, or originally was intended to be on a separate continent as the same world that the Greyhawk kingdoms were in, but also this Kickstarter that you're doing, which we'll talk about more, uh, you're, you're trying to develop Imperial, Imperial, Imperia for multiple game systems. So I'm you know, sure they are very Imperial. Yeah, they're uh, Imperial. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, you're developing, if I understand right from the Kickstarter, like Imperia is not just for D and D. It's all, you know you're trying to do multiple systems. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, which what is we're looking at, and and since I've been in the trenches for over forty years here, maybe I have a different perspective on the big picture. Amongst hobby gamers, and for all of you who are listening in, who had just have a casual interest. First, let me say that Dave and Gary, the folks who created Dungeons & Dragons, have spiritual descendants right there in your backyard. There's a company called Troll Lord Games out of Arkansas yeah, that Steve publishes Schnall. a game called Castles and Crusades, which is named after one of the original clubs that Gary started back in the 70s. So it's way cool. We're proud to support Arkansas and, and Arkansas tabletop gaming and all sorts of things through this outreach. Now, the reason this ties in is... When you play a role-playing game of whatever sort, it could be James Bond type, it could be fantasy, dragon slaying, out in science fiction is, is real popular, and there's some hot new games out nowadays for that sort of thing. But the whole idea is it, it's stories about your characters. You sit at a table, you talk to other people, that's all. There's no special weird equipment or settings or anything like that. You're just people sitting around talking, playing the roles of characters, within this setting, within this world environment. So what I'm doing is publishing a fantasy world background. Think of it as the backdrop, the stuff back there behind you on the stage while your characters are there performing. But what our challenge is, is number one, for my friends there in playing Castle and Crusades with the Little Rock game publisher Troll Lords, mm -hmm. I want you to be able to buy this set and use Troll Lords rules for their Castle and Crusades game 
to run your games. You just simply change the backdrop and move right in and keep playing your CNC game, as we call it, for Castle and Crusades. Right. Same thing applies then to many other game systems. Some are real similar to D&D, Dungeons & Dragons. Some are very different, like uh, RuneQuest from one of the great classic companies, been around for 40 years, Chaosium. Uh, another game called Savage Worlds is a little newer, started in the 90s, but that has this great pulp feel, kind of like Indy Jones and stuff like that, with lots of action and adventure there. So these are different approaches to fantasy, to fiction. And so Imperia is deliberately being released for 10 different rule sets at once because we realize they're all talking about good core fantasy principles, the same sort of things we see on TV and in the movies. And the differences in the different rules, what dice you use, how you describe a character, are not great enough to make this impossible. In fact, the games are 90 to 98% identical across the board. So it's a great opportunity. We're proud with my company, Loxley, me leading a team of about 16 people working together for the core group, plus another 20 guest stars, and present this for 10 different game systems, but in the process, keep the Imperia setting kind of in the background and let you keep focusing on your stories, your game system, your style, and of course your characters. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's very broad in scope, but also, and I'm, I'm not demeaning what it is. It's, it's not simple in concept. It's straightforward in concept, but it's very broad in, in stroke. And I, I don't think I've seen any, settings or or whatever or kickstarter related type projects that that have attempted to go across multiple settings so i you know i, I respect that ambition um, there have been a few now and then over the years there were two major series back in the 80s focused on thieves one called thieves guild one thieves world from different companies they tried to bridge the gap between game systems and they were very flexible we don't see products coming out like this because each big game company has a setting already, the backdrop that they present when they tell you about their game. When they support that and that game, they add more stuff, game stuff, into that setting, and they make the setting unique to and part of their game. But they don't have the time, the energy. They're busy paying their people, staying alive in the competitive marketplace. And they don't have the time, energy, effort, and certainly not the copyrights, the ownership of these properties, to release something like I'm doing for 10 game systems at once. What's the big difference? I don't have a game system. Right. I'm, I'm publishing for their game systems. And so all the game companies are saying, well, great, you're you're actually helping us to sell more stuff. Is this cool or what? And the gamers are saying, wow, we get more options. And I'm working with the game companies. This is very exciting. That's uh, going beyond behind the scenes. Some game companies have these already. Some don't. What about an intro, real short, fast, quickie version of their rules? So you can taste it without spending hundreds of dollars, which you got to go these days. And I'm not rich and you're not rich. So enough of that. An intro version, maybe just a short 16 pager. Maybe it's only a buck or two or five bucks. But in any event, a lot cheaper and simpler way when you have a common world like Imperia to go ahead and taste, reach out and see what other people are playing and why they're so into that while you're so into your rule system and maybe you look up from your backyard and realize, yeah, this big world is full of people who are playing almost the same kind of game I am. And then you reach out, you share ideas, you have community and we all win. Right. Excellent. Okay. So I got to get us to a break uh, so we could pay the bills. It'll be a short a minute or two break. When we come back, I want to talk about more about what Imperia is at a, as a setting uh, and kind of the history of Imperia, because Imperia goes back decades. So, you know, it's not just a, a new thing. So I'm curious to hear about that. I also appreciate you acknowledging uh, Troll Lord Games and Castles and Crusades. Steve Chenault has actually uh, been on this show several times. And Very cool. Yeah, a good friend of mine. Yeah, I love Steve. And they're actually sponsors of the show. So thank you very much for acknowledging, Excellent. you know, them. And, and, and if I understand correctly, they were one of the last publishers to actually work with Gary Gygax. Um, That's to, correct. To get some of his. But yeah, Steve and Davis and uh, Tony and all those guys over there are uh, 
are are great. Um, like Here's them a lot. Cool or Todd, not Tony. Go Todd. To yeah, go but ahead. They yeah. would come all the way to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and throw a game convention where Gary Gygax lived, just so he wouldn't have to put up with long-range travel. He was getting old and infirm. So they, they went the extra and really paid tribute to the roots, the people who built this city for the rest of us. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Uh, I love those guys. And Castles of Crusades is a heck of a lot of fun game to play. It captures the spirit of kind of old-school D&D with some more modern rules. But uh, people check out Castles of Crusades. They've got some other – they've got another game system out there called Victorious – uh, but you'll one of the breaks we'll hear from them uh, from an ad. But I'm going to go ahead and get us to a break. When we come back, we'll be talking with Frank Mincer uh, about his Imperia kick setting Kickstarter and learning a little bit more about the history of Imperia, which goes back all the way back to you know really kind of the beginnings of D and D. And folks, remember you can call in and talk with Frank yourself at 501 404. Six five. Shane, let me, let me six, jump zero. in real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. That is, uh, I got the wrong number on there. It's six five five five. five six five five five. My bad. No problem. Score that on. Uh, on we're we're rolling with this. Is like a D and D game. I know, right? No, it's like a D and D game. You monitor and adjust. That's when it. You roll with it. So uh, we will. Um, yeah, it's five zero one four zero four six five. Five five Correct. will be the number. Thanks for that clarification, Steve. We're going to go to a break. When we come back, we'll have more with Frank Mincer and Imperia. The smell of mildew emanates from wet stone walls. The only choices before you are to enter the door to the north or travel back up the stairs from whence you came. Uh, okay. I go to the door to the north. <laughs> In this room, you encounter an event promoter. Arkansas RPG Con is the Arkansas convention for all tabletop role-playing games. Arkansas RPG Con will be held on Saturday, October 21st at the Gene Moss Building, located at 913 East Severe Street in Benton, Arkansas. Early bird tickets are just $7, so visit ARPGCon.com for all the details about Arkansas RPG Con. Uh, okay, um, well I guess I go to Arkansas RPG Con. Yeah, that... That does sound pretty fun. Comic book lovers, visit the wildstars.com today. today. From the mind of author and comic book industry expert Michael Tierney, it's not just a comic book, it's a comic book novel. The Wild Stars is sci-fi and so much more. Learn the explanations behind UFOs and space gods. This isn't the Twilight Zone. This is the region of the Milky Way galaxy known as the Wild Stars. We guarantee you've never read anything like it. The complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell, with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read the Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. The die is cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today shame plays radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much however did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as one dollar an episode simply go to patreon.com slash shame plays 
Hey, we're back on Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. Folks, uh, just in case you're just now tuning on, tuning in, this is a temporary uh, station change for six weeks through November 11th due to Washita Baptist football being on uh, 96.5 FM, The Answer, our home station. Uh, so if you're listening like, what is this? Tune in. Listen along. Uh, you might you, you might just like it. Um and of course, folks, our normal listeners, uh, you may be catching us at on Sundays at 5 p.m. on uh, 96.5 FM, um, The Answer. So anyway, we're talking with Frank Mincer of D&D uh, fame, specifically the Red Box, but he's also, you know, done other. That's not all he's done, but that's one of the things that, uh, you know, he's best known for is the Red Box version, quote unquote, Red Box version of D&D that came out in the 80s and introduced a lot of people to the game. Uh, but what we're talking about today is uh, Frank has a uh, Kickstarter uh, for his setting Imperia, which is unique for a couple of reasons, or not unique, but unusual for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, Gary Gygax officially endorsed him developing this setting for D&D uh, low these many years ago, but also the Kickstarter addresses 10 different game systems uh, for the setting. So, uh, it's, it's really, really cool stuff. So, Frank, welcome back to the show. And I was hoping maybe you could give us a little rundown on the history of Imperia and how you've gotten from, you know, decades ago to where you're at now. Sure. First, we'll talk a little history, and then I'll tell you a lot about the uh, the world itself, what's going on. And that part really will be for geeks only, uh, serious fantasy role players. That's uh, fine. Uh, a little bit on history. Uh, I started this in about 1977. I started playing it a year earlier. So it's like really ancient history stuff. I uh, started developing it uh, based on existing materials at the time from another company called Judges Guild. And I just took a little chunk of a map they had, and I, I, I had my own ideas. So I kind of threw away most of their suggestions and was off and running. During the time that I developed it in the 70s, it grew from just me and one other guy to me being the game master telling the story uh, with as many as a dozen other players from all over greater Philadelphia on the East Coast. And uh, they talked me into applying at, to the publisher when um, a job came open. I had no chops, no experience, but I lucked out. I got a job. And within a year or two, I was a good bud of uh, the co-creator of the game, the guy who had built the company, Gary Gygax. And we discussed publishing this campaign at TSR. Unfortunately, that didn't materialize. He ended up getting forced out. I left to join him in another company, yada, yada, through the 80s. And so basically all of the stuff I did on the campaign in that period belongs to other publishers and things. So we're not using any of that material. But it's based on this original 70s material, all of it, both what I wrote for them and then what I've written since then. The development of the current campaign has mostly been since 1990. And in 1992, I started online. Yes, folks, that's 25 and a half years ago that I started an online D&D &D campaign. And the same wow. players from that first year are currently, all but one of them, are currently wrapping up the campaign. They are reaching the end of the story, which is very rare for a, a long-running campaign like this, and even more so for half a dozen people to hang in there for 25 years of real time in sat every Tuesday night playing the continuing adventures of these characters. Wow. Um, now so that I is a developing a lot of maps for it and details, adventures, all this sort of thing in digital form since 1990, because I got started on personal computers in the 80s, really. So that I mean, that's the very definition of a campaign. These now were these multiple generations of characters or has it been the same characters or how did how did how has that worked with that? One with of that? the well, each group had a different set of characters many times more than one character for one player uh in the uh original game in this in philadelphia everybody had two or three and occasionally characters would die this happens in fiction okay uh when i wrote the red box in the illustration story in the very beginning i made sure to show you that sometimes characters die and in this case 
that particular case, it was a heart-rendingly beautiful, appealing cleric named Alina, and some players are still grumbling about the fact that I killed her. But you had to learn this right away. Don't get overly attached to your fictional character. Be prepared for the inevitable losses down the road when eventually the dice roll wrong and the worst things can happen. But my campaign had groups in uh, Philadelphia, then in the uh, Lake Geneva area, various au famous authors, editors, writers, uh, artists, and people like Gary and Jim Ward, one of the early writers from the original D&D materials. People like this were in my campaign. I was very blessed. Uh, after that decade, then, as I say, I started online mostly, but I did start a face-to-face -face group, as we call it, in the Chicago area since I had moved out here to the Midwest. So there are various groups. They each had their own sets of characters within the given campaigns, including the one online. They hop around time a reasonable amount. It's fairly simple. If you've ever existed in one at one date, at one point in time, you can never go there again. You only get a one shot at it. So the time travel is somewhat regulated, but it's possible through certain magical devices and things. And I've knitted that into the actual storyline of the campaign. You have to go time traveling to do certain things at certain points in time to affect the course of history and that sort of business. Okay, so that's 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 pretty cool. I personally have never heard of a campaign that went that long, so that's amazing to me that you're able to. But that that's one of the strengths of the of role playing. You know, it can be what you want it to be. You know, as everyone as everyone comes together and builds something, you know, that's incredibly unique. And and like you said, you know, uh, at the beginning of the show, you know, there, there's all these different kinds of competition. But in the '70s, you had these games that. That kind of brought in you were kind of kind of working together. Uh, another other, another dimension of the game uh, is that it it really never has to end. And if I understand right, you know, before Gary Gygax formed TSR, um, he was going to other like Avalon Hill and other game companies, and and they just wouldn't get it. They couldn't get it. You know, he's like it never That's ends. And, you know, it never yeah. ends. And it does all this stuff. So it's it's such a unique, you know, different kind of thing. So um, now Imperia itself as I understand it, is on it started, at least in D and D terms, on a continent on the same world as Greyhawk, which is and I'm not ever sure I've ever heard the the name of the uh, of the planet said. It's O Earth, right? Earth? Uh, that's one of various things. Let me, yeah. Once again, let me back yeah. you up just okay. a bit. Yep. What we're talking about is really ancient history. Even the names, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, are unknown to most people these days who were born since. Many of your listeners, I'll bet, were born since Y2K, the year 2000. Many more in the 90s. I don't even expect you folks to remember my name. So we de-emphasize this ancient history aspect. Yes, it's nice. Yes, Gary did actually approve this as being on the same campaign world as his in this fictional universe. But what Imperia does, in addition to trying to uh, address various game systems and say we have more in common than you, than you think, the way Imperia is explained is basically this. I said it's intended to be the backdrop. Keep the focus on your style, your characters, your stories. But imagine a rectangle longer than it is tall. Okay, let's start okay, with that. Sure. On the left side is ocean that your ancestors centuries ago had to cross to get here. So why don't you have any contact with the old world? Well, it's complicated, but basically it's full of sea monsters. And these are sea monsters with intelligence and purpose, and they've been around longer than what they call the landers, the life forms that have arisen on the surface. So you're talking probably millions of years old for those folks. And bottom line, they they don't take too kindly to anybody using their ocean. So you're kind of stuck here. You don't have contact with the old world. What are you going to do? So you look around. You can't flee. You can't go back home. You're here. You're stuck. You've brought all these humans, this great expedition, and you're going to set up a whole new world, a new colony. And it turns out it can't be a colony because you can't get a hold of the folks back home. And when you land, you start meeting folks. It also turns out this is the original home of what we call demi-humans, the elves, dwarves, all of those folks. 
And they basically meet you a few yards from the shore and say, all right, we got to work this out. What's this uh, conquest business? No, 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 not going to work. And so the humans are between a rock and a hard place, and they end up being forced to go up some of the more obnoxious ways, like world conquest and pile all the wealth in one spot and sneer at the poor, things like this, bad habits of humans. Yeah, you did, terrible um, habits. They tend to take the easy routes. They always follow the water. Okay, they never really take much to the heavy mountains or deep woods. They always like to hang out by the rivers and have an easy life farming, that sort of stuff. So they work out compromises with the demi-humans along these lines. Now, the dwarves claim everything down below the surface. You know, that's dwarves. But they're not big on sun. So the gnomes, it turns out, have taken up a career racially of being the agents for the dwarven kingdoms. Okay, they're the ones who build towns up top and they handle all the commerce and this and that you do have some dwarves come out and these are the player character types now and then they tend to be a little on the pale side you know that that sort of thing right now the elves they're very cool they live in tune with nature they stick to the deep woods and out there beyond them you have the tricky stuff monstrous types and dragons and things further out on the edges in the in the unknown in the wilderness you also have the short folk. They call them the Niz overall, uh, local dialect, uh, including gnomes, hobniz, um, and broadly the sprites, fairies, brownies, who knows what lives in the woodlands. Those are the folks who are a little more shy. They don't like big settlements like elves and humans and folks like that prefer. So that's all spread out across this realm. The humans have seven cities that they've built, and they've... Uh, the, since they had to compromise, for 300 years, they've been working on three basic premises. Number one, don't screw up the planet. D forget your pollution and all that junk. Talk to the folks in the know, which are druids in this case, and figure out how to do stuff without screwing it up for everybody. Number two, pay attention to the gods. They say magic is the way to go, that the technology is just pride. You'll end up building things like computers down the road that you don't understand and smartphones, and it'll end up eating your lives. You'll, you'll lose the meaning and everything. So back off. And the third premise is pay attention to the people. They just want a chance to exist. They kind of like arts to make life worthwhile. But nobody ever seems to put money into that. It's always wars and bigger castles and all that crap. A combination of all these factors produce things like a highway system throughout the realm made of solid rock, simply turning mud into rock. It's simply moving one element, water, out of the rock. It's very easy to do. Other aspects of magic like this. But you don't end up having teleporters for commerce. That's much too expensive and practical and dicey as heck to boot. So it's little bits of magic as solutions to the normal challenges of the evolution of a society. Now there's That's also where we're at oh, in the world that we present. Now there's a lot going on in there too. In this rectangle I described, they're boxed in. On the east side is impassable terrain, things like a mile high cliff and a range of mountains that make the Himalayas look wimpy. To the south is the deep wood, where the elves came from and all that good stuff, but then there's monsters down there, and word has it that the big bad, some, some nasty guy, is mobilizing armies because he don't like this imperious stuff any too much, and you can just guess why. It's, it's working too well. Right? Right. To the north is an option, but it's mostly mountains like the Rockies, and there are all these giants up there. And there's this one rumor that the giants are actually off-worlders. That's why they're so much bigger. Huh. Anyhow, that's one of these mysteries that you'll be tracking down and they'll be reaching out to grab you once you're there. But we're not going to start with all that. You start with your characters, your stories, and wait for Imperia to reach out and reel you in. Nice. So it, it takes, um, if I'm hearing right, I mean, the basic demi-human races that, that what you would expect in a in a in a sort of D and D ish fantasy setting or all there, mm -hmm. right? It's, you're not, you're not sure. trying to reinvent what a dwarf is or not at all. Is or anything and like this that. is one of the big hurdles we have because every setting, I love some of the cool new races in, for example, Pathfinder and now Starfinder. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it, but some of it gets pretty extreme. It's not the folks you see walking down the street in an ordinary town. The D&D I grew up with, the fantasy role-playing we see most written about, most successful, 
is closest to home, the more like real people or real elves, if you will, yeah. dealing with everyday lives and dealing with occasional troubles that come up. And boy, we got troubles of plenty coming this way. This this whole realm is just running too well. Um, as I say, you got sea monsters on the west, you got bad guys on the south, you got potentially alien giants are acting up, and on top of all that. The dragons are getting pissed off. All the adventurers go out, you know, let's go slay a dragon. Yeah, okay, cool. And the dragons have about had it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a dragon ruler that is rising, and he just might unite them, and they just might set up their own realm. So everybody's waiting to see what happens on that one. So it sounds like that, you know, uh, Imperia is sort of a a board with all the pieces set. And, and, and there's a lot of interesting things about to unfold. So are, are all of the interesting things that can unfold contained in the initial setting? Or do you see this as a living setting where, you know, continual, you know, this year, here's the challenge. And, and, or, or is it all contained in, in this initial offering, you know, years worth of uh, potential challenges and, and encounters? Yeah. And yeah, so how, how is that going to work? The scope is huge, both within the setting and in tackling 10 game systems at once. And then on top of that, having 20 guest stars, you know, world-renowned uh, writers and authors. Uh, it's a complex project. What we had to do early on is zero in. Here's this campaign world, extremely detailed. And the way I tend to design is very... Uh, wormy and squirrely, you you know you un uncover one rock and you find leads that go to six other storylines on on half the major plots that pop up, uh, and yet it is action adventure oriented, has all the stuff you want in a good good D and D campaign. So what we had to do is zero in on one point in time out of the three hundred and really more than that, but three hundred year history leading up to this one point. The pivotal point in time is the vanishing of the capital city imperia itself over 2000 miles a massive 90 foot rock wall around the whole thing again using magic but the bad guys come a war starts and interaction of magical artifacts or something like that wipes out all the good guys and all the bad guys in one swell foop and you're left with a chaos afterwards but a way to get imperia back and which, of course, the bad guys are going to be back to try and interfere with that, too. Mm -hmm. So of all this meta story and all this, how do you turn it into a, not a storytelling game, a real action adventure thing? How do you really keep everybody on their toes? And we decided it's during this one five to ten year period leading up to the vanishing of Imperium. Uh, all the powers and forces are in play and there's all kinds of stuff going on, but not right away. Uh, it, we leave it to the game master, we present him with the storyline, and given time travel, and we encourage the ability to say, okay, and you went about your lives for another six months, and you each gained a level, and then. That's not, you, you don't see that in campaigns very often, but I want to give the DMs freedom to jump ahead that way, so you don't have to play out every nut and bolt a right. little bit along the way of a multi-year plan. So it's like in between. I've been doing this oh, online for 25 years, and talking to my players, there's things I do, fluidity of time. You don't over-examine a tiny slice. You don't speed up too much across a big slice. And the balance has worked out pretty good. So I'm bringing that expertise, that background of mine, into this set and to guidelines, concrete guidelines for the game master on how to make it all work just as well for your group. And I think that 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 players will be receptive to that. I'm about to have to get us to another break, but I did want to say that I think players will be receptive to that because, you know, we get to, like, in between TV seasons, sometimes things jump ahead and we see that mm -hmm. players sure. or, or in between movie series, you know, things jump ahead. So I, I think people or even novels, you know, novel trilogies or whatever that happens. So I have never personally played in a campaign where that happened, but I think it would be really neat. So let me uh, do this, folks. I'm going to throw some love at a sponsor. We'll get another break in, including this time, I believe we'll have uh, an ad for Castles and Crusades. And then we come back. I'd like to talk with Frank if he's, uh, up for it about like more of specifics about the Kickstarter and who's involved and what people can get out of the Kickstarter and, and that sure. sort of thing. So here we go. Some goblins are your friends. I don't know if they're your friends in Imperia or not, but in general, some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer of Magic the Gathering, Warhammer 40K, board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and 
hobby accessories. Call Game Goblins at 501-224-GAME or visit them online at GameGoblins.com. That's 501-224-GAME or GameGoblins.com. Check them out. They're conveniently located at 1121 South Bowman, right on the corner of Bowman and Canis in West Little Rock, and staffed by friendly employees. Game Goblins has expanded their store size, and there's plenty of room for exciting inventory and tables for play space. You'll like that space because Game Goblins has gaming events for every day of the week. Make sure to check out all the, or check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. First time customers, mention Shane Plays and receive $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Tell them Shane Plays sent you. Hey, we're back on Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love, which is both a live radio show and then later a podcast. We're talking with Frank Mincer, uh, of D and D and Redbox fame, although in his own words he'll say it's not a big deal. I'm just a gamer, and that's a quote directly from a uh, interview with Frank over at Ian World. Go check that out. It's a great article on this Kickstarter, and Ian World's a great site. So go check them out if you haven't already, and you're an RPG fan, uh, folks. Remember, if you're if you're on Faith Talk 99.5, and you're like, hey, why am I hearing Shane plays Geek Talk? Uh, it's a temporary station change through November 11th. Uh, and I'll replay on my normal station, 96.5, on Sundays at 5 during this time. So we've got Frank Mincer for, oh, about another four or five minutes. Frank, I like to say uh, that that time is a predator that stalks us all our lives, especially in radio. It's always over before you know it. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, uh, let people know more. We've talked about Imperia, really, really cool sounding campaign, uh, you know, that has roots back many years but you know like like we don't have to worry about the history here's what's going on now sounds like really cool stuff how can people get in on this uh via your kickstarter what what's all what's the details on your kickstarter well um short and sweet the box set itself is 75 dollars. we're shipping next summer some kickstarters get bogged down uh because they're not professionals i put together a team of professionals that has literally centuries of experience in the game industry that's only 40 years old uh the lineup is just incredible i can't do all this alone so first off uh, a gal named darlene who did the original maps for gary gygax's box set in the 80s is doing the maps for this and she's also managing the art team of this for other maps where we've tapped to uh, been lucky to to get two of the of the great current digital map artists Alyssa fadden and anna meyer uh we have a big team of uh web people and and the business side and all that we've also drawn uh, in a whole variety of friends of mine that i've known for about 30 years uh, great artists, uh, the top names, Jeff Easley, Larry Elmore, Janelle Jacques, Errol Otis w- did the covers of D&D sets in the 80s, and he's agreed to do a piece or two for us. Yeah, I actually and cut my teeth on his. And then authors on top of that, like Ed Greenwood and Tracy Hickman. I mean, I, those are my two leads right there. But including Zeb Cook, who's been uh, doing work with Skyrim and such for years, but he's coming back out to the role-playing scene to do this just as part of this team. Right. Uh, various other just legendary authors, artists, and I'm proud to have been able to draw everybody together. This requires a large business operation, though, to get that kind of mega uh, influx of, of great legendary artists, writers, the right advertising, the whole web team and all that. So we're all hard at work making it happen. It's it's business. And we'll, we have no problems at all with the timeline. We're all set up with most expensive uh, or the top quality printing for the best costing. You know, it comes into those business decisions. Uh, and all of the time frame for that and the deliveries, it's all one big package that the analysis is nearly finished, all the budgeting and everything, and full steam ahead. Well, excellent. And another another couple of names that I want to throw in there. Uh, I mean, the, if the amount of names is just mind-boggling, uh, the pedigree here. But you've also got Jeff D., who's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, I've had him on the show talking about villains and vigilantes a couple of times. Him and Jack Yeah, uh, my original favorite uh, fa- uh, superheroes game. Yeah, I was never that big on on uh, hero games stuff, and V and V. I mean, it just grabbed me. I know? actually got into V and V before I got into D and D. V and V was really my first love Quite in role playing cool. games. So. Um, Let's see. That music indicates we're getting close, but we got a little bit of time here. 
Uh, also, you're working with Ted Foster, who is an author that I keep up with mm-hmm. on Twitter and talk yeah, to. Yeah, he, he and I are working hand in hand on a lot of the creative aspects. And he, he's been handling logistical stuff. I hate to ask him to do that, but he's been helping on that. Yeah, end. I've talked with him a lot. Uh, okay, so Frank, I got to do this to you. I apologize in advance. Uh, I hope that the waiver made it to you for absolving me of any psychological damage or therapist fees. But <laughs> we have the bad joke of the week every week. Uh, to, to finish off uh, Shane Plays Geek Talk. So are, are you ready for the bad joke of the week? Uh, before you do, here's yeah. your takeaway on Imperium. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, one-liner. Yeah. It's your other campaign world. Don't give up your current game. Consider this an add-on. All right, I love it. And I wish you all the success. People go check out Imperia on Kickstarter. The, the pet, you'll never see another pedigree like this on a role-playing game product. I, I guarantee it. Okay, so here we go. I bet you'll already know this one, Frank. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl using the bathroom? Or a pterodactyl? Oh. Gary and I used to have pun contests. Some others refused to play with them, but I was yeah. the victim. And I'm the victim again. Yeah. Ah. Because the P is silent. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I have to do that to you. You've been a wonderful guest. I could talk to you all day, but I wish you all the success. And thank you so much. I feel privileged that you made time to speak with me. Frank, I hope you have a great week and much success with your Kickstarter. You too, Shane. Thanks for the invite. Yes, thank you. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight, or run. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. Win the treasure. TSR Hobbies. Dungeons and Dragons games. Products of your imagination. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual? For as little as $1 an episode, simply go to patreon.com slash Shane